Moby Dick, chapters 92 to 96. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 92 to 96. Chapter 92. Ambergris. Now this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce, that in 1791 a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on the subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but a French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the sea coast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments. But ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastilles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking, and also carry it to Mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect, of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of brandreth pills, and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first Stubb thought might be sailors' trousers buttons, but afterwards it turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner. Now, that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay, is this nothing? Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory, and likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk, also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savor, cologne water in its rudimental manufacturing stages is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly, untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London, more than two centuries ago, because those whalemen did not then, and do not now, try out their oil at sea, as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber into small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks, and carry it home in that manner. The shortness of the season in those icy seas, and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is that upon breaking into the hold, and unloading one of these whale cemeteries in the Greenland dock, a savor is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital. 
I partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland in former times of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smeerenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports, smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out, without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat kettles, and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation certainly gave forth no very pleasant savor. But all this is quite different with a South Sea sperm whaler, which in a voyage of four years perhaps, after completely filling her hold with oil, does not perhaps consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and in the state that it is cast, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is that, living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odor, nor can whalemen be recognized as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company by the nose. Nor indeed can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant, when as a general thing he enjoys such high health, taking abundance of exercise, always out of doors, though it is true seldom in the open air. I say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlor. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant with jeweled tusks and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honor to Alexander the Great? Chapter 93 The Castaway it was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever-accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale-ship it is not every one that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved called shipkeepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these shipkeepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boat's crew. But if there happens to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a shipkeeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little negro Pippin by nickname, Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip! You have heard of him before. You must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight, so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over-tender-hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe, a tribe which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks the year's calendar should show naught but three hundred and sixty-five Fourth of Julys and New Year's Days. Nor smile so while I write that this little black was brilliant. For even blackness has its brilliancy, behold yon lustrous ebony, panelled in king's cabinets. But Pip loved life and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped had most sadly blurred his brightness, though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him, in the end was destined to be luridly illuminated by strange wild fires that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which, in his native Tallinn County in Connecticut, he had once enlivened many a fiddler's frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide with his gay ha-ha had turned the round horizon into one star-belled tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue-veined neck, 
The pure watered diamond drop will healthful glow, yet when the cunning jeweler would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb, then the evil blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewel stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass that in the Ambergris affair, Stubbs after Oarsman chanced so to sprain his hand as for a time to become quite maimed, and temporarily Pip was put in his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily for that time escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb, observing him, took care afterwards to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now, upon the second lowering, the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap which happened in this instance to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, and in such a way that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him so as to become entangled in it, when at last plumping into the water. That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto! Poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtego stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line, and turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut! Meantime, Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, Do, for God's sake! All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. Damn him, cut! roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost, and Pip was saved. So soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. Tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, business-like, but still half-humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done, unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except, but all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat is your true motto in whaling. But cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice and concluded with a peremptory command, Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump, mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind, and don't jump any more. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that, though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveler's trunk. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool, and flatly stretching away, all round to the horizon, like gold-beater's skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves. No boat-knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubb's inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out of the center of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, 
another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore, but the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship, and only coast along her sides. But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least, because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed, no doubt, that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly, and pick him up. Though, indeed, such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur. Almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so-called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned and gave chase, and Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon the fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, God-omnipresent, coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom, and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought which to reason is absurd and frantic and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. Chapter 94 A Squeeze of the Hand that whale of Stubbs, so dearly purchased, was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg Tun, or Case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs so soon as filled with the sperm, and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the tri-works, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree that when, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps, here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. A sweet and unctuous duty! No wonder that in old times this sperm was such a favorite cosmetic, such a clearer, such a sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence, like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, 
literally and truly like the smell of spring violets. I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow. I forgot all about our horrible oath. In that inexpressible sperm I washed my hands and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill-will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, 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 all the morning long I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands, and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged, repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases man must eventually lower, or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing on sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the tri-works. First comes white horse, so called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish, and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs, ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich, mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground, dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it, I confess that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe. It is called slob gallion, an appellation original with the whaleman, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Glurry, so called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. 
nippers. Strictly this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is the short, firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of the leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgee, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room, and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pike and gaffman and a spademan. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With his gaff, the gaffman hooks on to a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spademan stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. This spade is sharp as hone can make it. The spademan's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes, or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber-room men. Chapter 95 The Cassock Had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this post-mortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange enigmatical object, which you would have seen there lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers. Not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet-black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol indeed it is, or rather in old times its likeness was, such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which King Asa her son did depose her, and destroyed the idol, and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor called the Mincer, who now comes along, and assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter the pelt of a boa. This done, he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching so as almost to double its diameter, and at last hangs it well spread to the rigging to dry. Ere long it is taken down, when removing some three feet of it towards the pointed extremity, and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him, while employed in the peculiar functions of his office." That office consists in mincing the horse-pieces of blubber for the pots, an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse, planted endwise against the bulwarks, and with a capacious tub beneath it, into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a rapt orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves, what a candidate for an archbishopric! What a lad for a pope were this mincer! 
Footnote. Bible leaves! Bible leaves! This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as, by so doing, the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality. End of footnote. Chapter 96 The Tri Works Besides her hoisted boats, an American whaler is outwardly distinguished by her tri-works. She presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship. It is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks. The tri-works are planted between the foremast and the mainmast, the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength, fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar some ten feet by eight square, and five in height. The foundation does not penetrate the deck, but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron, bracing it on all sides, and screwing it down to the timbers. On the flanks it is cased with wood, and at top completely covered by a large, sloping, battened hatchway. Removing this hatch we expose the great tripods, two in number, and each of several barrels' capacity. When not in use they are kept remarkably clean. Sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand, till they shine within like silver punch-bowls. During the night watches, some cynical old sailors will crawl into them and coil themselves away there for a nap. While employed in polishing them, one man in each pot, side by side, many confidential communications are carried on over the iron lips. It is a place also for profound mathematical meditation. It was in the left-hand tripod of the Pequod, with the soapstone diligently circling round me, that I was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid, my soapstone, for example, will descend from any point in precisely the same time. Removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks, the bare masonry of that side is exposed, penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces, directly underneath the pots. These mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron. The intense heat of the fire is prevented from communicating itself to the deck by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works. By a tunnel inserted at the rear, this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates. There are no external chimneys, they open direct from the rear wall. And here let us go back for a moment. It was about nine o'clock at night that the Pequod's triworks were first started on this present voyage. It belonged to Stubb to oversee the business. All ready there? Off hatch then, and starter. You cook, fire the works. This was an easy thing, for the carpenter had been thrusting his shavings into the furnace throughout the passage. Here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the triworks has to be fed for a time with wood. After that no wood is used except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel. In a word, after being tried out, the crisp shriveled blubber, now called scraps or fritters, still contains considerable of its unctuous properties. These fritters feed the flames. Like a plethoric burning martyr or self-consuming misanthrope, once ignited, the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body. Would that he consumed his own smoke, for his smoke is horrible to inhale, and inhale it you must, and not only that, but you must live in it for the time. It has an unspeakable wild Hindu odor about it, such as may lurk in the vicinity of funeral pyres. It smells like the left wing of the Day of Judgment. It is an argument for the pit. By midnight the works were in full operation. We were clear from the carcass, sail had been made, the wind was freshening, the wild ocean darkness was intense. 
but that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames, which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues, and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging, as with the famed Greek fire. The burning ship drove on as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed, so the pitch and sulphur-freighted brigs of the bold hydriote canaris issuing from their midnight harbours with broad sheets of flame for sails bore down upon the turkish frigates and folded them in conflagrations the hatch removed from the top of the works now afforded a wide hearth in front of them standing on this were the tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners always the whale-ship stokers with huge pronged poles they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding pots, or stirred up the fires beneath, till the snaky flames darted, curling, out of the doors to catch them by the feet. The smoke rolled away in sullen heaps. To every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil, which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces. Opposite the mouth of the works, on the further side of the wide wooden hearth, was the windlass, this served for a sea-sofa. Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire till our eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards, and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, all these were strangely revealed in the capricious emblazonings of the works as they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them, like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro in their front the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on and the sea leaped and the ship groaned and dived, and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night, and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth, and viciously spat round her on all sides. Then the rushing Pequod, freighted with savages, and laden with fire, and burning a corpse, and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her monomaniac commander's soul. So seemed it to me, as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fire-ship on the sea. Wrapped for that interval in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night in particular a strange and ever since inexplicable thing occurred to me. Starting from a brief standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side, which leaned against it. In my ears was the low hum of sails, just beginning to shake in the wind. I thought my eyes were open. I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids, and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by. Though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card, by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom, now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression that whatever swift rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens astern. A stark, bewildered feeling as of death came over me. Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was, somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me, I thought. Lo, in my brief sleep I had turned myself about, and was fronting the ship's stern, with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind, and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night, and the fatal contingency of being brought by the lee. 
Look not too long in the face of fire, O man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campagna, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books the same, the truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. But he who dodges hospitals and jails, and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise and therefore jolly, not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mould with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e., even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up, then, to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges, and soar out of them again, and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. End of chapters 92 to 96 Moby Dick, chapters 97 to 100. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 97 to 100. Chapter 97 The Lamp. Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counsellors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, to eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth an Aladdin's lamp, and lays him down to it, so that in the pitchous night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps, often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oils, in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state. 
a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore. It is as sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil, so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveller on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98 Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already it has been related how the great Leviathan is afar off descried from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner, how in due time he is condemned to the pots, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire, but now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities, sliding along beneath the surface as before, but, alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel casks, and while, perhaps, the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck, like so many landslides, till at last, manhandled and stayed in their course, and all round the hoops rap-rap go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now, ex officio, every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pint is casked, and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced and hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil. On the sacred quarter-deck enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled. Great rusty casks lie about as in a brewery yard. The smoke from the triworks has besooted all the bulwarks. The mariners go about suffused with unctuousness. The entire ship seems great leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you and prick your ears in this selfsame ship, and were it not for the tell-tale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with a most scrupulously neat commander. The unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides, from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale, a potent lie is readily made, and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lie quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags to restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight, all tackles are coiled in unseen nooks, and when, by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions, shift themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow, as bridegroom new leaped from out of the daintiest Holland. Now, with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics, propose to mat the deck, think of having hanging to the top, object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint to such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity. 
they know not the thing you distantly allude to. Away, and bring us napkins. But mark, aloft there, at the three mastheads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught, infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture, and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere. Yes, and many is the time when, after the severest uninterrupted labors which know no night, continuing straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line, they only step to the deck to carry vast chains, and heave the heavy windlass, and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks, when on the heels of all this they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship and make a spotless dairy room of it, Many is the time the poor fellows, just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks, are startled by the cry of, There she blows! And away they fly to fight another whale, and go through the whole weary thing again. Oh, my friends, but this is man-killing! Yet this is life, for hardly have we mortals, by long toilings, extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then with weary patience cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done when, there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world, and go through young life's old routine again. Oh, the metempsychosis! Oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece two thousand years ago did die, so good, so wise, so mild. I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope. Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter-deck, taking regular turns at either limit, the binnacle and mainmast, but in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause in turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose. And when resuming his walk, he again paused before the mainmast, then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, only dashed with a certain wild longing, if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by the strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now, for the first time, beginning to interpret for himself, in some monomaniac way, whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and the round world itself but an empty cipher, except to sell by the cartload as they do hills about Boston, to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence east and west over golden sands the headwaters of many a pactolus flows, and though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the verdigrees of copper spikes, yet untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its Quito glow. Nor, though placed amongst a ruthless crew, and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the live-long nights shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where sunset left at last, for it was set apart and sanctified to one awe-striking end, and however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the weary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last, and whether he would ever live to spend it. 
Now those noble golden coins of South America are as medals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here palms, alpacas, and volcanoes, suns, discs, and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving are in luxuriant profusion stamped, so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories by passing through those fancy mints, so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the Pequod was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border it bore the letters, Republica del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world, and beneath the great equator, and named after it. And it had been cast midway up the Andes, in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountain tops and towers, and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted, and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab. And this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which, like the magician's glass, to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains, for those who ask the world to solve them. It cannot solve itself. Methinks now this coined sun wears a ruddy face. But see, ay, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before he wheeled out of a former equinox at Ares, from storm to storm. So be it, then. Born in throes, it is fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it, then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it, then. No fairy fingers can have pressed the gold, but the devil's claws must have left their mouldings there since yesterday, murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below. Let me read. A dark valley between three mighty heaven-abiding peaks that almost seem the trinity in some faint earthly symbol. So in this veil of death God girds us round, and over all our gloom the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her mouldy soil, but if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance half-way to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture. And if, at midnight, we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, lest truth shake me falsely. There now's the old mogul, soliloquized Stubb by the triworks. He's been twigging it, and there goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long, and all from looking at a piece of gold, which did I have it now on Negro Hill or in Corlier's Hook? I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Humph! <laughs> In my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings, your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Papillon, with plenty of gold moiderets and pistoles, and joes and half-joes and quarter-joes. What should there then be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda, let me read it once. Hello! 
here's signs and wonders truly. That now is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the zodiac, and what my almanac below calls ditto. I'll get the almanac, and as I have heard devils can be raised with Dabol's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curvicues here with the Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders, and the sun, he's always among em. Hem, hem, hem. Here they are. Here they go. All alive. Aries, or the ram. Taurus, or the bull. And Jiminy, here's Gemini himself, or the twins. Well, the sun he wheels among em. Aye, here on the coin, he's just crossing the threshold between two of the twelve sitting rooms all in a ring. Book, you lie there. The fact is, you books must know your places. You do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar and Bowditch's navigator and de Bull's arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs and significant in wonders. There's a clue somewhere. Wait a bit. Hist! Hark! By Jove! I have it! Look you, doubloon! Your zodiac here is the life of man in one round chapter. And now I'll read it off, straight out of the book. Come, almanac. To begin, there's Ares, or the ram. Lecherous dog, he begets us. Then Taurus, or the bull. He bumps us the first thing. Then Gemini, or the twins, that is, virtue and vice. We try to reach virtue. When, lo, comes Cancer the crab, and drags us back. And here, going from virtue, Leo, a roaring lion, lies in the path. He gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw. We escape and hail Virgo, the virgin. That's our first love. We marry and think to be happy for I. When pop comes Libra or the scales, happiness weighed and found wanting. And while we are very sad about that, Lord, how we suddenly jump, as Scorpio or the scorpion stings us in the rear. We are curing the wound when wang come the arrows all around. Sagittarius, or the archer, is amusing himself. As we pluck out the shafts, stand aside. Here's the battering ram, Capricornus, or the goat. Full tilt he comes rushing, and headlong we are tossed, when Aquarius, or the water-bearer, pours out his whole deluge and drowns us. And to wind up with Pisces, or the fishes, we sleep. There's a sermon now, writ in high heaven and the sun goes through it every year, and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty. Jollily he, aloft there, wheels through toil and trouble, and so, alo here, does jolly stub. Ah, jolly's the word for I. Adieu, doubloon. But stop. Here comes little King Post. Dodge round the triworks. Now, and let's hear what he'll have to say. There, he's before it. He'll out with something presently. So, so, he's beginning. I see nothing here but a round thing made of gold, and whoever raises a certain whale, this round thing belongs to him. So what's all this staring been about? It is worth sixteen dollars, that's true. And at two cents the cigar, that's uh, nine hundred and sixty cigars. I won't smoke dirty pipes like Stubb, but I like cigars. And here's nine hundred and sixty of them. So here goes Flask aloft to spy him out. Shall I call that wise or foolish now? If it be really wise, it has a foolish look to it. Yet if it be really foolish, then it has a sort of wisish look to it. But if asked, here comes our old Manxman, the old hearse-driver he must have been, that is, before he took to the sea. He luffs up before the doubloon. Hello, and goes round the other side of the mast. Why, there's a horseshoe nailed on that side. And now he's back again. What does that mean? Hark! He's muttering. Voice like an old, worn-out coffee-mill. Prick ears and listen. If the white whale be raised, it must be in a month and a day when the sun stands in some one of these signs. I've studied signs, and know their marks. They were taught me two score years ago by an old witch in Copenhagen. Now, in what sign will the sun then be? The horseshoe sign. 
for there it is right opposite the gold. And what's the horseshoe sign? The lion is the horseshoe sign, the roaring and devouring lion. Ship, old ship, my old head shakes to think of thee. Mm, there's another rendering now, but still one text. All sorts of men in one kind of world, you see. Dodge again. Here comes Queequeg, all tattooing. Looks like the signs of the Zodiac himself. What says the cannibal? As I live, he's comparing notes. Looking at his thigh bone, thinks the sun is in the thigh, or in the calf, or in the bowels, I suppose, as the old women talk surgeon's astronomy in the back country. And by Jove, he's found something there in the vicinity of his thigh. I guess it's Sagittarius, or the archer. No, he don't know what to make of the doubloon. He takes it for an old button off some king's trousers. But aside again, here comes that ghost devil, Fadala, tail coiled out of sight as usual, oakum in the toes of his pumps as usual. What does he say with that look of his? Ah, only makes a sign to the sign, and bows himself. There is a sun on the coin. Fire worshipper, depend upon it. Ho! Oh! more and more. This way comes Pip. Poor boy. Would he had died, or I. He's half horrible to me. He, too, has been watching all these interpreters, myself included. And look now, he comes to read, with that unearthly idiot face. Stand away again, and hear him. Hark! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar, improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now? Hist! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Why, he's getting it by heart. Hist! Again! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they, are all bats, and I'm a crow, especially when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw, 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 ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers, and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me. Complimentary. Poor lad. I could go and hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so, I leave him muttering. Here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly too, for when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha! Ha! Old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail you. This is a pine tree. My father, in old Tallinn County, cut down a pine tree once, and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection, when they come to fish up this old mast, and find a doubloon lodged in it, with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Oh, the gold! The precious, precious gold! The green miser'll hoard ye soon. Hish! Hish! God goes mong the worlds blackberrying. Cook! Ho! Cook! And cook us! Jenny! Hey! 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 Jenny! Jenny! And get your hoe-cake done! Chapter 100. Leg and Arm. The Pequod of Nantucket meets the Samuel Enderby of London. Ship ahoy! Has seen the white whale! So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter-boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. 
He was a darkly tanned, burly, good natured, fine looking man of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. Has seen the white whale. See you this? And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. Man my boat, cried Ahab, impetuously, and tossing about the oars near him. Stand by to lower. In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water, and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own, and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequod, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea, for the great swells now lift the boat high up toward the bulwarks, then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So deprived of one leg, and the strange ship of course being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab and in the present instance all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship leaning over the side by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes for at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters but this awkwardness only lasted a minute because the strange captain observing at a glance how affairs stood cried out i see i see a vast heaving there jump boys and swing over the cutting tackle as good luck would have it they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous and the great tackles were still aloft and the massive curved blubber hook now clean and dry was still attached to the end this was quickly lowered to ahab who at once comprehending it all slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook it was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree and then giving the word held himself fast and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head with his ivory arm frankly thrust forth and welcome, the other captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg, and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east, and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him, on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan, and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the cause of it at least. And that leg, too? Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? "'It was the first time in my life that I ever cruised on the line,' began the Englishman. "'I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. "'Well, one day we lowered for a pod of four or five whales, "'and my boat fastened to one of them. "'A regular circus horse he was, too, "'that went milling and milling round so, "'that my boat's crew could only trim dish "'by setting all their sterns on the outer gunwale.' presently up breaches from the bottom of the sea a bouncing great whale with a milky white head and hump all crow's feet and wrinkles it was he 
It was he, cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoon sticking in near his starboard fin. Aye, aye, they were mine, my irons, cried Ahab exultingly. But on. Give me a chance, then, said the Englishman good-humouredly. Well, this old great-grandfather with a white head and hump runs all a foam into the pod and goes to snapping furiously at my fast line. Aye, I see. Wanted to part it. Free the fast fish. An old trick. I know him. How it was exactly, continued the one-armed commander, I do not know, but in biting the line it got foul of his teeth, caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, so that when we afterwards pulled on the line, bounce we came plump on to his hump, instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking, Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, I resolved to capture him, in spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in, and thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth it was tangled to might draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale line. Seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat. Now, Mr. Mounttop's here. And by the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mount Top, the captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mount Top's boat, which, do you see, was gunnel and gunnel with mine. Then, snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But, Lord, look you, sir, hearts and souls alive, man. The next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air like a marble steeple no use sterning all then but as i was groping at midday with a blinding sun all crown jewels as i was groping i say after the second iron to toss it overboard down comes the tail like a lima tower cutting my boat in two leaving each half in splinters and flukes first the white hump backed through the wreck as though it was all chips we all struck out to escape his terrible flailings, I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But the combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forward, went down in a flash, and the barb of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when, when all of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest. Uh, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship's surgeon. Bunger, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunger boy, spin your part of the yarn." The professional gentleman, thus familiarly pointed out, had been all the time standing near them, with nothing specific visible to denote his gentlemanly rank on board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one. He was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling spike he held in one hand and a pill-box held in the other occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he politely bowed, and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. "'It was a shocking bad wound,' began the whale-surgeon, "'and taking my advice, Captain Boomer here stood our old Sammy—' "'Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship,' interrupted the one-armed captain addressing Ahab. "'Go on, my boy.' stood our old Sammy off to the northward to get out of the blazing hot weather there on the line. But it was no use. I did all I could, sat up with him nights, was very severe with him in the matter of diet. Oh, very severe, chimed in the patient himself, then suddenly altering his voice, drinking hot rum toddies with me every night till he couldn't see to put on the bandages, and sending me to bed half seas over about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, ye stars! He sat up with me, indeed, and was very severe in my diet. Oh, a great watcher, and very dietetically severe as Dr. Bunger. 
Bunger, you dog laugh out, why don't you? You know you're a precious jolly rascal. But heave ahead, boy. I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man. My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir, said the imperturbable, godly-looking Bunger, slightly bowing to Ahab, is apt to be facetious at times. He spins us many clever things of that sort. But I may as well say, en passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict, total abstinence man. I never drink. Water! cried the captain. He never drinks it. It's a sort of fits to him. Fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia. But go on, go on with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon coolly. I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that, spite of my best and severest endeavours, the wound kept getting worse and worse. The truth was, sir, it was as ugly gaping a wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black. I knew what was threatened, and off it came. But I had no hand in shipping that ivory arm there. That thing is against all rule. Pointing at it with the marling spike, that is the captain's work, not mine. He ordered the carpenter to make it. Uh, he had that club hammer there put to the end to knock someone's brains out with, I suppose, as he tried mine once. He flies into diabolical passions sometimes. Do you see this dent, sir? Removing his hat and brushing aside his hair and exposing a bowl-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scarry trace nor any token of ever having been a wound. Well, the captain there will tell you how that came here. He knows. No, I don't, said the captain. But his mother did. He was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you, you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunger, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog. You should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. What became of the white whale? now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this by-play between the two Englishmen. Oh, cried the one-armed captain, oh, yes. Well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time. In fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what whale it was that had served me such a trick, till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line, we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he. Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? And I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well then, interrupted Bunger, give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen, very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it, too. So that what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness, for he never means to swallow a single limb. He only thinks to terrify by faints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe to swallow jackknives, once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest, and there it stayed for a twelve-month or more, when I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do you see? No possible way for him to digest that jackknife and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system. Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it, and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving a decent burial to the other, why, in that case, the arm is yours. Only let the whale have another chance at you shortly, that's all. No, thank you, Bunger, said the English captain. He's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it, and didn't know him then, but not to the other one. No more white whales for me. I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that. And there is a shipload of precious sperm in him. But hark ye, he's best let alone. Don't you think so, Captain? 
glancing at the ivory leg. He is, but he will still be hunted for all that. What's best let alone, that accursed thing is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou saw him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul, and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunger, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog strangely snuffing. This man's blood! Bring the thermometer! It's at the boiling point! His pulse makes these planks beat! Sir! Taking a lancet from his pocket, and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast! roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks. Man the boat! Which way heading? Good God! cried the English captain, to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? whispering Fadala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lips, slid over the bulwark to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him. With back to the stranger's ship, and face set like a flint to his own, Ahab stood upright till alongside of the Pequod. End of chapters 97 to 100